the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice. We're going to lift our voices and clap our hands. Here we go. We rejoice.
Thank you, Jesus, for the joy that we have. It's not just a fake smile on our face, but it's a joy that reaches to the depths of who we are because we have new life. We have abundance because of your faithfulness, Lord. And so we respond with worship and we respond by believing that there are greater things on the other side of this moment because you have always been faithful. You are more than able to do far above and beyond anything we could ever ask or think. We invite you into this place. Yes, we do. We respond with worship. We know who you are. And when did I start to forget? All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe That you weren't sufficient for me? Oh, why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? I know you do them. Cause you are more than able. You are more
everything God is. God is more than able. God is more than able. God is more. sing today. He is the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Yes, it is. You are, you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You're the way maker. Yes, you are. together we say amen can we give him another shout of praise we love you lord i'm so glad you came to access church this morning hey why don't you turn to somebody next to you give them a high five and then check out this video well good morning access church how are we doing this morning Oh, come on, we can do better than that. One more time. Master Church, how are we doing this morning? Well, we are so glad you guys are here. If we haven't met already, my name is Barry, and I get the privilege to serve as a youth pastor here at Access. And so I want to take a special moment to say thank you so much for joining us this morning. But better yet, I want to say thank you for all those worshiping with us online. Come on, make some noise for all them worshiping with us online. We're so glad you're worshiping with us. Well, if you're in person, 
thank you so much for being here. As you walked in, you were handed a worship guide and in it there's a connection card. We just ask that you fill that card out with as much information as you feel comfortable with. And if this is your first time here, we are so glad you're here. But as you exit, take that connection card, go to the lobby to, to our guest services and we have a team that wants to connect with you. We have a gift for you just saying thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, here at Access, we like to say we are a giving church. And so there's always three ways that we give. The first way that you can give, you can give in person. You can drop that off in the black boxes in the back as you exit. And the second way that you can give, you can go online at access.tv slash give. And the third and final way that you can give, you can give any dollar amount. You can text any dollar amount to the number 84321. It is a safe, secure steps. It'll walk you step by step through that process. Well, I have two things I want to highlight for us this morning. And the first one is this. You might hear it in my voice. I don't have a voice this morning. It's because this weekend we took about 30 students to Fine Arts to Orlando. And so if you're not familiar with Fine Arts, it is a discipleship tool that we use with students to develop in their gifts and so they can worship the Lord. And so we brought percussion solos. We had a worship team. We had short sermons. And so there's a picture of all of our students here. Come on, make some noise for our students. We are so proud of our students. We have the most talented and gifted students here at Access Youth and here at Access Church. And so we love them, we're proud of them. And so we just wanted to highlight them. One more time, let's make some noise for our students. The second thing I wanna highlight is Access Young Adults is happening tonight at 7 p.m. right here. If you're in any ages from 18 to 30, you wanna be in this place tonight at 7 p.m. I heard there's a guest speaker coming tonight that has a word, so you're not gonna to wanna to miss it. It's gonna be great. And so we just, again, we wanna say thank you so much for joining us this morning. Now grab your message notes as Pastor Jason comes and is gonna close our series, We Are Access. Check this out. Hey friends, it's your friendly neighborhood, Mike Burns. And we are in the middle of our We Are Access series. And today we've got a fun story for you. I'd like to introduce you to my good friend. Her name is Jess Stevens. If you've been around Access for a little bit, you might have seen her at Access Kids Check-In or maybe on stage with Access Worship, or maybe you've just seen her in the lobby and got to know her, she's a great person. But what you might not know is this, she's been around Access for a long time like since 2008. Actually, I'll let her tell you. Yeah, so when I first started coming to Access, I was 18 and some friends had invited me um, to try something different because um, I had grown up in church and um, I was just, I wanted to try something new. And when I came to Access, it was, it immediately felt different. It was fun and inviting and we were meeting in the back of the Y at night, which was automatically different because it wasn't Sunday morning. Coming to Access was so, such a breath of fresh air for me because it was just a different environment. It wasn't so, it didn't feel so stuffy and it was just, it was totally unique for me. And it was the like probably the first place that I really felt like I was home, honestly. Um, I was able to just be myself with friends and really dig into what it meant to have my own relationship with God as apart from like what I had been told to have with my parents. And I went all in. I um, I came with my friends and we I fully plugged in and I started getting involved with serving with the kids. I am pretty sure I'm one of the first people that got baptized at Access in the pool at the YMCA. Anything else big happen? And I met a cute guy. <laughs> you know what, fun fact is um, one of Jason and I's like first photos together was one of the Access Easter. <laughs> yeah. I asked Jess if she had any specific memories from the early days, thinking she would get sentimental, but instead I got this. The smell of the... <laughs> The smell of chlorine and the old men walking around with their towels on. That was always a sight to see during a setup and teardown. <laughs> or even at Jenkins, and like the smell of lockers in the gym where the kids where the kids were. And it's been really fun to witness just how far access has come from when we first started going at the Y to um, being at George Jenkins to where we are now and where we're going. It's just really 
amazing to think of what God has done in our family, um, in my life alone, from choosing to say yes to attending. And one of the best things for me and my husband that we've been able to witness is just watching our kids grow at Access, um, even to the point where they they decided on their own to get baptized this past February. And that was such a big deal and amazing to watch because it's just nice having a church that truly values seeing, knowing, and loving our kids. It's crazy to think that every single member of my family, myself, my husband, and my two kids have been baptized at Access. It's hard to sum up what it's meant to me to, to come to Access because so much of my life has been built there. Like getting married, having kids, like just the friendships that we've made. It's awesome to see how God has used those things in our life. It's so amazing to see what God can do when you stay faithful and stay planted where you are. Oh, come on somebody, can we celebrate that? I love it, love it, love it. And I hope you get this, there is something so powerful about planting your life in a local church. I say this sometimes, you'll never find a perfect church and if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you will mess it up. And, uh, but we, we really do believe that life change happens when we plant ourselves and when we're faithful in the same direction for a long time. So we love them, what an amazing story. Hey, would you do me a favor right now? Would you put your hands together and welcome those who are joining us at Church Online right now? Literally people all over the world every week join us and it's a privilege, such a cool opportunity we have to bring church all over the world. I love that so, so much. Well, we're in a series called We Are Access and I'll get to that in just a moment. But before I do, I wanna honor one special group of people. This is always a bittersweet week of the year, every year for me. This is the week that colleges here in Lakeland have their graduation and I wanna honor those who are graduating. If you are a senior and you are graduating, would you stand up so we can honor you? Come on, stand up, stand up. You need to stand up, stand up. Come on, let's hear it for them, everybody. Amazing, congratulations, love you. So cool. It's always sad because they leave us jerks. I um, mean, so, so cool. Well, we are wrapping up a series today that I've really loved. The series is called We Are Access. And if you're new to this place, let me kind of catch you up on what this series is about. There's something beautiful and special that happens when we gather in Jesus' name. And I never want you to miss it. Our whole church is a life-giving church and we exist to help people take the next step in their relationship with Jesus. And so every year we do a series that just reminds us of the stuff that really matters here. Week one, I started the series by saying because of what Jesus did for us, we can be made new. Not better, not improved, not a more polished up version of ourselves, but entirely new. Then we, we talked about that week one, then last week, week two in the series, check this out. We baptized 63 people in one Sunday. Come on, somebody. Just amazing, amazing, amazing. And then I preached the message last week that really said this, that as a church, we won't stop. We will do everything we can until Lakeland looks like heaven. And I want you to see this. Next week, we are giving these shirts away to every single person in our church that comes. We've even got them for babies, everybody. Like, we got onesies. We got you. It's gonna be awesome. We want you to have these because this isn't just a t-shirt. This is a prayer that you can wear everywhere you go, that you can be reminded every time you put this shirt on that we as a church will do whatever we can to reach people. We will do what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. We will pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and in earth as it is in heaven. That means we're gonna do everything we can until Lakeland looks like heaven. Today I've got a different message for you as we wrap up the series. It's gonna be a great one. Let's get going today. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got a text message from a group of pastor friends and we all celebrate each other. We're in a small group community with each other and it was right after Easter and everybody had these big Easter Sundays and so we were all celebrating each other and giving each other virtual high fives, and then it was my turn to share what happened at Access, and I was so proud of you. Unbelievable, between church online and in person, we had 7,000 people at Access that Easter weekend, and I was so proud of you, and so I, I texted that to the group, and then I said, and here's the bigger number, over 100 people made a decision to follow Jesus. What a big deal, and what a big day. I love that. And so then after I texted that, one of my pastor buddies texted me on the side, and he asked me this question, he goes, Jason, I've been watching you for so long, your church is amazing, and it seems like it's exploding in growth. Then he asked this question, he said, what is the 
secret sauce? Like what is it that makes this church explode in growth? What is the secret thing that you're hiding that's causing access to grow so much? And I thought about it and I started typing a response. Now, um, I use an iPhone uh, because I'm a Christian and um, <laughs> well, that always upsets some people. And uh, you can meet Jesus, just go to the Apple store for yourself. And um, anyway, so I don't know how other phones work because I'm not a Neanderthal, but I have this phone. And on an iPhone, when you text another iPhone user, it puts up the bubbles when they're typing. Have you seen this before? And so he texts me like, what's the secret sauce? And I typed something and I was like, no, nah, and I deleted that, bubbles. Type something else, bubbles, deleted it. And after about five rounds of that, he's like, bro, what are you doing? And I just, I wrote back and I said, I don't know what to say. I originally I typed, the pastor is so handsome. And that's more like a woo kind of moment, but therapist and I will work that out. Anyways, I deleted that. And I, I thought through a lot of things, and there's a lot of stuff about our church that I really love. I, I really believe that we are the most life-giving, welcoming kind of church. I hope that from the parking lot to your seat, you feel loved. I feel, hope you feel encouraged. Uh, some time ago, someone put a Google review of our church online. They gave us one star, and they said, I came to this church, and no one said hi to me. And I wanted to respond, liar! Ain't no chance that happened, because you are the most friendly, engaging, loving people I've ever met, ever. So maybe it's that, but it's not that. And I thought maybe, maybe it's um, our amazing ministry to the next generation. We love kids and students so much. And we have the best children's ministry and youth ministry and young adults anywhere. And, and, but it's, it's not that. And I thought, okay, maybe it's our worship and we have the best worship. I love our team. They are so gifted, so incredible, and so talented. Every once in a while, they'll sing a song I never heard. So I'll go to Spotify and I'll listen to it later and I like us better than the original artist. That's my experience. Thank you. Always jealous of people that are talented like that, but whatever. And so it's, but it's not that, and I love our worship. Maybe it's our missions or our outreach, and I love that, but it's, but it's not that. Maybe it's the community that we build by getting together in our access groups, and I love that for you, but it's not that. Maybe it's our irrational generosity, but it's not that. And maybe it's the preaching, but it's definitely not that. But it's like, what is it? And then, and then I, I realized what it was, and here's the answer. This is the secret sauce at Access. We are a spirit-empowered church. The Holy Spirit leads this place. In fact, let me confess something to you. I'm not that good of a leader. I'm not. I'm not that great of a decision maker. I try to be empathetic and caring. I try to be irrationally over the top generous. I try to listen to my team, love my team, serve my team. I care about my team's kids. I, I, I love leading, but I don't think I'm that good at it. Like some people are natural born leaders, not your boy here, but here's what I am good at. Getting out of the way and saying, Holy Spirit, you're in charge. You call the shots. We'll follow whatever you ask us to do. But we let the Holy Spirit lead this place, and you can feel it. People use their own words, but they say, when I come in, there's just something different, something alive in this place. That's not me, that's not our efforts, that's not our best strategies, that is the Holy Spirit at work in this place. So today, I wanna take our few minutes that we have together, and I wanna talk to you about what does it mean to be a part of a spirit-led, spirit-empowered church, but maybe more importantly for you, what does it look like for your life to be the kind of life that when you walk into the room, people are like, ooh, What's on that person? What's different about them? Oh, let's get to work today. The book of Acts chapter one, it's after the gospels. This is what's happening in the Bible. Jesus has died on the cross, risen again from the dead. Celebrated that a few weeks ago at Easter. And he's, he's been teaching, showing himself to just a handful of people it seems. And then he's going to leave. But before he leaves, he gathers his followers and he says, guys, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone. Jesus saw what happened, his followers who were with him. They were with him, they saw all the miracles, heard all the teachings, but when Jesus' head fell in death, they cowered in fear, they ran to the obscurity of the shadows, and they hid in shame. Jesus says, I'm leaving. But you don't have to do that again, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone. Now I want you to know who he's talking to as well. Jesus is talking to this ragtag bunch of guys and girls that were Galileans. Now that might mean nothing to you, but you need to understand in Jesus' day to be from Galilee was looked down upon. That they were seen as lower class, lower educated. They had unique thick accents that you, you couldn't, you would easily be able to tell when a person was from Galilee. 
And Jesus talks to these bunch of nobodies, these fishermen, they wouldn't have big jobs or high education. And he talks to them and here's what he says to them, Acts chapter one, verse four. It says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, shout out to the Bible for always talking about food. It says, he gave them this command. It says, I want you to stay here. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the, yeah, come on, this is the word today. Wait for the, the gift. My father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Then he says, for John, baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There is a second baptism available to believers. And then he says, verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And here's the result of the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the power that God gives us. As a result, you will be my witnesses. You're gonna share what you've encountered in Jerusalem, your city, Judea and Samaria, your region or your country, and to the ends of the earth, the rest of the world. Here's what Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I'm not leaving you alone. In fact, I want you to stay here in this city until you encounter the gift that God has for you. Now, I want you to understand this about the Holy Spirit. He is a gift from God to believers. And he says this, he says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit encounters, comes upon you. The word for power is this interesting word in the Greek language. We would transliterate it to the word dynamite. It's the word dunamis. This word dunamis means this explosive Power. I love the book of Romans, which it's connected to the Easter story where it says this. It says the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is alive and active inside of you. Think about how much energy and power it would take to raise someone from the dead. You can have that same explosive dynamite, dunamis power alive in you. Okay, let me, let me talk to all the people who feel like the reluctant leaders. Let me talk to all the people who feel like they were born without the courage that they see in other people. You don't have to live another day in your own strength, in your own ability, in your own courage, or your own power. But as a follower of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, you get to live a dunamis power, a dynamite, an explosive power kind of life. How do I know this is true? Just a few chapters later, here's what's happened. Remember earlier, those disciples hung their heads in fear when Jesus died? They encountered the Holy Spirit. Literally the next day it says Peter goes out and preaches and 3,000 are saved and baptized, crazy story. And then later there's this persecution that breaks out. All the Christians spread to the known world and everywhere they went, the power of God was there and changed the cities. In fact, here's an account from Acts chapter 17 of some people who encountered those followers of Jesus who had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 17 verse six, it says, these who have turned the world upside down, they've come to our city too. They're like in our neighborhood, those people who flip the world upside down, how amazing would, would it be if that was said about you? How incredible would it be if that was said about our church? That those people, those people from Access, those people that work with me, there's something so different, so unique about them that they flip the world on its heels. They've turned this whole thing upside down and they've come here too. Today I wanna to talk to you though about what it looks like to be so filled with God's Holy Spirit. Some years ago, it was just a normal Sunday morning, I was doing my thing preaching and I noticed that there was this family that they, they looked at me like they were like deers with their eyes stuck in the headlights. They just, their eyes were just really big. And after the service, they beelined up to me and they said, we need to talk to you. It's like, okay, what is it? And as a pastor, normally that's not a good statement to start with and they're like, we need to talk to you. It's like, okay, fine, what, what, do you, what do you wanna talk about? And they said, well, not now, can we talk later? It's like, well, then just email that, okay? So we, anyways, we get together that week, we met at a coffee shop and we sit down and there's no pleasantries. They don't say, how are you? How's Liz? How's the family? They literally sat down and they said this. They said, what is it? So what is what? They said, what is it? It's like, what, the birds and the bees? You need that talk? Like, what is it? No, no, what is it? No, the, the Holy Spirit. They said, what is the Holy Spirit? They said, we were raised Baptists. We've been Christians our whole life. And we read the Bible for the first time on our own, which is something all of you should do, by the way. It's good for you. And they said, we read it, we got to the book of Acts and we read about the Holy Spirit, but we don't know what the Holy Spirit is. And so we went to our pastor and he wouldn't tell us. He said, oh, you don't need that. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. You don't have to have the Holy Spirit. It's not that big of a deal. And I said, hold up, hold up, okay. I, I wanna talk to you about what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, because I want you to understand. Uh, let me start with this. There's a theological term, you're gonna get some education today. There's a theological term called cessationism. Cessationism is this belief that when all of the apostles and followers of Jesus and all of Jesus' disciples died, 
that the gifts of God, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit died out. They ceased to exist after those people all died. And I can get behind that idea, except it's not in the Bible. Like it's not. All the gifts of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, all that he empowers us to do, it is all alive, active, and available for believers today. But here's the problem. There's a lot of Christians who will say, well, I do believe in the Holy Spirit and I do believe in the gifts of God and I do believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the truth is no part of your life reflects the fact that he's alive and living in you. I could give it to you like this. You might consider yourself a practical cessationist. It is to say I believe in the gifts of God, but no part of my life reflects the idea that he's alive, active, and at work in me. Why do we do this? I'd like to submit a really simple reason the reason many of us say we believe in the Holy Spirit but no part of our life reflects his activity and his power in our life is because we reject the things we don't understand. This is a really dangerous way to live your life. In fact, it's funny because we don't live any other part of our life that way. I have no idea how electricity works. I have no idea how the internet works. I have no idea, I have no idea about how a lot of things work, but I accept them and I, I move on. I celebrate them, I live with them. The things of God are gifts to Christians, and to reject them because you don't understand them is essentially you rejecting the things of God. You, you reject the best of God. Can I tell you my goal in the next few minutes as we look at the person of the Holy Spirit? Um, recently, my kids watched this movie for the first time. It's, it's an old classic called Napoleon Dynamite. Have you seen this movie? And it has honestly ruined our household. They quote that thing all the time. Tina, eat your ham, like all the time. But there's a scene in the movie, it's kind of like a, a subversive little scene, not that big of a deal, but there's a scene where there's a girl sitting at a table and a man is making a sales pitch to her for these ships that are in a glass bottle. Have you, do you remember this moment? And the girl looks at it and her eyes get really big and she goes, I want that, okay, I want that. Can I tell you my goal for you today when it comes to the Holy Spirit? I want you to leave with fresh understanding of who he is and I want you to leave saying, I want that. Like I want all of God's best for me. We reject the things we don't understand, so let me try to help you understand who the Holy Spirit is. Let me start with this. First of all, the Holy Spirit, he is not in it. Why does this matter? Because the Holy Spirit is not an object, it's not a force, it is a person. When Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit, he always talks about him as a he, as a person. Why does this matter? Because you can't have a personal relationship with an object but you can have a personal relationship with a living person, a living member of the Holy Trinity of God. What, what does this mean? Well, we believe as followers of Jesus that there is one God that we serve, but in three distinct persons. It, it's like this, it's, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I can explain it to you like this. We, we can get our heads around this one because we, we understand what a father is. And regardless of how good or bad your example of a father is, we all understand what a father is. We can get our heads around that. Then there's Jesus, God the Son, and, we all have a son, know a son, are a son, we've seen a son, so we have some context for that. But then the idea of God, the Holy Spirit, if we could just get honest for a moment, I think it's weird for us. I think it's challenging for us because even the language we use around the person of the Holy Spirit is different, it's unique. We use words like spirit or the Holy Ghost. We use terms that we associate with the Halloween season and maybe that just doesn't make sense to us, but I'm gonna show you in a moment how the translators of scripture had a challenge as they tried to translate the Hebrew and Greek words for Holy Spirit into language that we would understand in English. Uh, let me start with this simple explanation. We said that there's God the Father. God the Father is God for us. He's for you. Then there's Jesus. And at Christmas, we talk about Jesus being Emmanuel, which means he's God with us. But the Holy Spirit is so important for your every single day life because he is God in us. In every situation, in every circumstance, he's God with you. So let me teach it to you like this. As a follower of Jesus empowered by the Holy Spirit, I don't live a single day without communicating with, talking to the Holy Spirit. Before I walk into difficult meetings, I say, Holy Spirit, be with me and help me. Before I have to make difficult decisions, I say, Holy Spirit, guide me. Like he can be a part of every single part of your life and he's God that's alive inside of you. And I said a moment ago that it's hard to translate some of the words from the original languages in the Bible to words that make sense to us. Let me show them to you. 
In Hebrew, and the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for spirit or Holy Spirit is the word ruach, which is a fun word to say, especially in allergy season, by the way. So like if you're, if you're struggling right now, just repeat this with me, ruach, you can clear your throat, ruach. And this, this word literally translates to mean a wind breath, a violent exhalation, a blast of breath. You can find the Holy Spirit from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end. Genesis chapter one, verse one, this is the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit, the ruach of God was hovering over the waters. This idea is this picture of breath and wind and a, an exhalation. In Greek, which most of the New Testament is written in, the word for spirit or Holy Spirit is the word pneuma. It means a current of air, a blast of breath, a strong breeze. This word pneuma, maybe you can hear it in words like the root of it in words like pneumonia. It's connected directly to our breath and to our breathing. I want you to understand why this matters so much. Because the Holy Spirit sometimes gets a bad rap, but I wanna give you a picture of who he is. He is a breath of fresh air. You ever been on vacation up in the mountains somewhere, out by the beach, and you walk out of your rented hotel or condo and you, and suddenly everything in the world seems better? You ever had this? You ever had a day where it felt like there was wind at your back, wind in your sails? You ever had this experience? If you've ever had those moments, you understand that this is a picture of who this Holy Spirit is. He is a breath of fresh air. He is wind in your sails. He propels you towards the life God has for you. Now let me dispel a rumor or two about the Holy Spirit. Here's one. It's that he, the Holy Spirit, is is weird. He's not weird. Can I tell you something? People are weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. It's a bad opportunity to like elbow the person you're sitting next to, but like he's not weird. Maybe you've seen some weird, goofy stuff and it's caused you to stiff arm the person of the Holy Spirit. And I just came to say to you, the Holy Spirit is not weird. He's not pushy. People can be weird and people can inflect or act in strange ways when it comes to the person of the Holy Spirit. But he's not. Remember what scripture said? He's a gift. But let me show you a few of the meanings of the Holy Spirit. And all of these are gifts from God to you and me. Number one, the Holy Spirit. He is my inner voice. I want you to get this We serve a speaking God. God doesn't want prayer to be a one-way monologue. Prayer is a two-way conversation that is a dialogue. The Holy Spirit, he speaks to us. He challenges us. He uses his voice to lead and to guide us. I love this in the book of John. It says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, when he comes, he will convict. We'll come back to that word. He'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. I want you to understand something about conviction. Conviction is actually a gift from God. Now, unfortunately, a lot of Christians conflate the words conviction and condemnation. Let me explain the difference. Condemnation is a word, a word that's against your soul that can only come from the voice of Satan. It's a word of judgment, guilt, shame. It's a word that says you'll never be enough, you'll never do enough to get God's forgiveness. God could never possibly love you anymore because of all the things you've done. Condemnation pulls you away from the voice of God, but conviction is a gift. It is that tapping on your heart by the Holy Spirit saying, this isn't the way, but I can show you the way back towards Jesus. This is the goal. Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit will always point us to Jesus, and we get these all mixed up. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but maybe if you can think back to the time that you made a decision to follow Jesus. Had this happen over and over and over. At the end of every service, I'll give people an opportunity. I'll say, if you wanna start or restart a relationship with Jesus, now's your moment. And people will say things to me like, I can't explain it, but it's like my heart. I just felt this tapping on my heart. I had the sense that I had to do this. That is the conviction of God, which literally leads us to Repentance, he convicts us. Uh, Scripture says this in the book of 1 Corinthians, this is Paul talking, and he says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He leads us and he points us to Jesus. That's one of the gifts. One of the next gifts that you need to understand about the Holy Spirit is that he is my teacher. Now, I'm all for education. I've done everything I can do in terms of school. A couple of years ago, I finished my doctoral degree, which just means I will never go to school again, everybody. That's all it means. I'm done guilt-free, I'm never going back ever. And I love education, I love reading, I love classes, I love all the stuff, but here's what I want you to understand about God. 
He wants to keep teaching us about who he is, and I want you to see this, and also who we are. He wants to teach you about who he is, but he also wants to remind you of who you are. In the book of John, here's Jesus again talking, and he says this, he says, but the counselor, it's another word for the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. He's gonna teach us the ways of God and he will remind us of who we actually are. Several books later in the Bible, the same author, John, in the book of 1 John says this. He says, but you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything that you need to know. Some years ago, I was doing premarital counseling for this awesome couple, and I went through the section about life and marriage and family and backgrounds and all the stuff, and we got to the section on, on, on spiritual growth. So I said, okay, guys, what is your plan to grow spiritually? And they looked at me and they said, whatever you tell us to do. I said, do you know how dangerous that is? I am all kinds of messed up. Like you don't wanna trust the person when you can get it from God himself. Can I tell you, we serve a speaking God. You have a Bible which is the living word of God and a God who speaks by his voice to the innermost parts of who you are. You don't need a person to teach you. You have the word of God and the spoken word of God and it's amazing. Number three about the Holy Spirit, here's a gift. He is my guide. Okay, can I confess something to you? I just told you I love education, I love studying and all of whatever, and I, but here's something about me. As smart as I think I might be, I am so dumb when it comes to directions. Anybody else want to admit this? I could get lost in a parking lot. I don't know how I got anywhere before GPS has came out. I will be real about this. I can't read a map. One of my life dreams is to be on the TV show, The Amazing Race but I will be out on the first round unless my partner knows how to get directions and read a map. People are like, here's what you do. You just head south for four miles and turn west. I'm like, do you think I'm Christopher Columbus or Lewis and Clark? Give me directions like turn left at Chick-fil-A. You know what I mean? Like I need simple, easy directions. And I'll never forget, before phones and iPhones and all this came out, I bought something called a TomTom. -tom. It was my very first GPS. Older people know what this is all about. Young people are like, I always had one, you know? So, it clipped into my car and it told me where to go and I felt like a superhero. I could get anywhere I needed to go because it was giving me directions. Okay, check this out. How incredible would your life be? How stress-free would your life be if you realized you didn't have to make any decisions in your own wisdom, intellect, or strength, but you have the person of the Holy Spirit guiding you. Jesus says this, John chapter 16. He says, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into what? into all truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears and will tell you what is yet to come. He speaks, he guides, he leads us. 750 or so years before Jesus lived, the prophet Isaiah prophesied and he said this, he said, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, now you have a part. Walk in it. God's gonna do his part, he'll speak to you, you do your part, follow what he tells you to do. Another gift of the Holy Spirit I want you to understand. This might be the most important one for some of you today. The Holy Spirit, he is my friend. You could add parenthetically, he's my best friend. We live in a world where we've lived and outlived a pandemic, but there's an endemic that all of us are living with every single day. It is the endemic of loneliness. People are clinically lonely, we're depressed, we, we're more connected to each other in the sense that we know what's happening with our friends because we have phones and social media, but we are disconnected relationally. One of the curious things about being alive in this world right now is that you can be surrounded by people. You can be in a room like this with hundreds of people around you. You can be so close to people that you could literally reach around you and touch a dozen people, and yet you can feel so isolated and alone in the same moment. Can I tell you something? One of the beautiful gifts of the Holy Spirit is you never have to live one more day feeling alone in this life. You can wake up every single morning and say, good morning, Holy Spirit, and you can start a conversation that never has to stop. He's close, he's near, closer than your next breath. Jesus himself said this in John chapter 14. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor, this is another word for the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. This word, if you read it in different translations of the Bible, sometimes it translates that same word, counselor, advocate, helper. One translation even says, I will give you another friend. The Greek word for this is the word parakletos. 
This is a beautiful word because this word para means with and kletos means to come alongside. The, the picture, if you will, is imagine that there was a long box that was really heavy and there was a handle on both ends of the box and I reached down and I picked up the front end of the box and I started carrying it by myself. Could I do it? Maybe for a little bit. I, I could muscle it, I could try to pull it in my own strength. But imagine another person came alongside and grabbed the handle in the back and lifted it. It would be so much better, so much easier, so much less stress, so much more effective in this moment. This is the picture of the parakletos. He literally comes alongside you and he helps to shoulder and lift the burdens you're carrying in this life. You never have to live another moment in this life feeling alone and isolated because the Holy Spirit is with you, he's near, he's helping you, and he's your friend. The end of the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul, Paul gives this beautiful benediction. A benediction is kind of like the closing of a prayer or the closing of a service. And in 2 Corinthians, I love this. This is from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase called the, the Message. He says, I want you to see this, the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. I think for a lot of us, we can understand the grace of God he forgives what feels unforgivable. What he did for us on the cross, what Jesus did for us on the cross is the greatest display of grace ever. It's the reason the only word that feels adequate as an adjective is amazing. The love, extravagant love of God. What great love to give his own son for the sins of the world. We can get our heads around this, but we skip this last part. It's the intimate friendship. He's close, closer than your next breath. So here's how I wanna end today. What do we do? Like, What do we do with the Holy Spirit? How, how do we go forward? What does this mean for us? And I want you to see what Paul says in the book of Ephesians chapter four. He says, don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit is moving and breathing in you. It is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Then I love this last line. He says, don't take such a gift, there's that word, don't take a gift for granted. How do we not take the gift, the person of the Holy Spirit for granted? Here's how I wanna end today. I wanna give you three dangerous prayers to pray. And they're really simple. They're four words each. Like it's not that big of a deal. But I want you to start every day this week praying these four prayers. And maybe as you pray these prayers, you'll start to put your own words and your own language and context into it. But start with this and see how God changes you. Prayer number one, this is dangerous. Holy Spirit, show me. What are we asking him to show us? Show us more of who God is. Show me about the amazing grace of Jesus. Show me about the extravagant love of the Father. Show me about the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. Show me. But here's the dangerous prayer. When you're saying show me, you're not just saying show me more about God. You're also saying show me more about me. A few hundred years before Jesus lived, there was a prophet named Ezekiel. And he said this, and I love this. This is a picture of a transplant that happens. He says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit, ruach, in you. I will remove you, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And he says, and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Pause here for just a moment. Here's a part where a lot of Christians struggle. They think I can never possibly measure up to all of God's standards and all of his rules and all of his laws. Can I talk to you about this for just a moment? I think for a lot of us, the reason we struggle is it feels unattainable in our own strength. Here's the principle when it comes to laws and rules. Laws and rules are meant to be you know, served in the context of relationship. Rules and laws outside of relationship always lead to rebellion, but rules in a relationship always lead to love and understanding. What does it mean? It means I have rules for my kids at home. The reason I have rules for my kids is not to judge them or to punish them. It's because I love them and I want the best for them. According to Ezekiel, what happens when you say, Holy Spirit, show me, is there's a heart transplant that takes place and all of a sudden, your heart of stone, you living for you is transplanted with a heart that beats in the same cadence as God's. You care about what God cares about and so his laws, his rules become your normal day because you live to please God. Here's another prayer. This is David praying in the book of Psalm 139. He says, search me, oh God, and know my heart. 
Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and here's what you do, lead me in the way everlasting. This is a dangerous prayer to pray because you're saying, Holy Spirit, show me the areas in my life where I'm not fully surrendered to the ways of God. Number one, Holy Spirit, show me. Number two, here's the second prayer. Holy Spirit, change me. Awareness is the key indicator for change. But to be aware of something and to not change it is a waste of emotional energy. I want you to get this. Don't just pray, show me what to do, but give, say, Holy Spirit, give me the power to change. Holy Spirit, change me from the inside out. Book of 2 Corinthians, Paul says this. He says, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the Lord is who? The Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. We become more and more like Jesus, which is one of the key roles of the Holy Spirit, when we allow him to change us from the inside out. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, change me. Ready for prayer number three? It's really simple. Holy Spirit, fill me. I want you to see this. You don't need some massive youth camp experience. You can pray this every single day. Holy Spirit, fill me. Why does this matter? We tend to fill our lives and fill our hearts with all kinds of stuff. Candidly, it's not even bad stuff. We fill our stuff, we fill our lives, we fill our calendars, which ultimately has this way of crowding out the capacity of our heart to know and love God. We fill our hearts with lots of things. It could be good things. It could be hiking and golf. It could be football. It could be watching sports on TV. It could be reading books. It could be taking walks on the beach. Nothing wrong with any of those things, but I want to say this to you. There is only one throne in your heart. The one who created you created space for him in it that only he can fill and fulfill. So what do we do? We say, Holy Spirit, fill me so that my heart isn't cluttered with all the other stuff that competes for the throne which belongs to you, God. I want you to see what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. Paul says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts, I want you to see this. It says, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This isn't a one-time thing. If every single day you woke up and you said, Holy Spirit, show me. Show me who you are, but show me who I am. Show me my need for God. Change my heart. Secondly, Holy Spirit, change me. Make me a different person. Give me the heart that beats in the same rhythm and cadence as yours. And then Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Make me more and more like Jesus. Can I tell you what will happen when you pray this? Book of Romans, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that dunamis, dynamite power is alive in you. Your life will feel like a breath of fresh air. You will feel wind in your sails. Your life will feel different and it will be different and people will notice because you were never intended to do this life in your own strength, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your head and close your eyes all over this place? We're just gonna pray those three prayers. And as I pray, would you just like not let me pray by myself, but let's pray this together. Let's start with that first one. We say all together, Holy Spirit, show me. Show me who I am. Show me my need for a savior. Show me the areas where I'm not living for you the way I should. God, we pray that you'll show us more of who you are. And as a result, we'll see our areas of deficiency. Secondly, we pray, Holy Spirit, change us. May we not stay the same. May we not be just aware of our need for you, but instead may we be so concerned, so consumed with passion for you that we change to become more like Jesus. And then Holy Spirit, here's my prayer for all of us. Fill us. Fill us to overflowing. May we so encounter, be so enveloped by your Holy Spirit, God, that we're changed. And every single day, may we wake up and ask you to fill us again. Thank you for it, God. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, maybe you came today and you don't know if you're right with God. Maybe this means you've never started a relationship with God or maybe you just feel like you've wandered so far away today, you need a fresh start. If you feel like this is for you, that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of conviction, of him saying, listen, you can't do this on your own, but instead you need Jesus to save you and to forgive you. 
If you wanna start or restart a relationship with God, would you raise your hand right now? Because this moment is for you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks, yep, thank you. Wow, here's your moment. If this is for you, would you pray this with me and hear me out? Praying a prayer only changes your life if you mean it with your heart. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe you came into this world and died on a cross in my place. And because you died and then rose again, I believe you have power to forgive me. So Jesus, today I confess that I need you to save me. I've sinned and I need your forgiveness. Would you forgive me, change me, make me new from the inside out. From this day on, I'll follow you. Jesus, I love you. I give you my life for the rest of my life. And it's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Church family, come on, let's celebrate it. We just had people pray to make a decision to follow Jesus. Love it. What's up? Thank you, Pastor Jason, for such an incredible message. I know that challenged my heart. Well, if that was you that started or restarted a relationship with Jesus, you're in the right place. Our whole church exists to help people take the next step in their relationship with Jesus. So if that was you, I wanna invite you right now, pull out your phone. I need you to text the word access to the number 97,000. If you're not good at math, it's nine seven with three zeros. And our team is gonna reach out to you and we just wanna help you alongside your new faith journey. Well, everyone stand, I wanna pray a blessing over you. As you're standing, I wanna highlight just one thing. Young adults is happening tonight, 7 p.m. Don't forget, if you're 18 to 30, be here. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for coming to this place. Father, help us to know that your Holy Spirit is with us. Help us to be challenged by this message this week in our workplaces, in our homes, in our families, in our schools. And help us to know that you're with us, that you're guiding us each and step of the way. So be with us. Let's have a great day. And in Jesus' name, amen. See you all next week.